in which uh, Konstantinos Mechanicidis will talk about QNLP in more depth and uh, it will cover the experiments that we've realized and what we're working on at the moment. This will be uh, followed by a session, an interactive session by Richie, uh, who's going to give you a demo of Lambeck, our QNLP toolkit, and uh, hopefully we'll make this um, interactive a bit. Um, he's already sent you the notebooks on Slack, so you can already download it. But, I mean, focus on what Konstantinos is saying, but if, uh, if you have a bit of time, you can download it and install it. All right, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. OK, hello. Um, we were close with experiments on QNLP. I will show you how we realize in practice all of the stuff that Bob was talking about, especially and specifically for, for um, realizing some quantum uh, natural uh, language processing on actual quantum computers, as well as uh, um, numerical simulations. And I will close with the vision for the next year and the experiments we will um, dazzle all of you in a year or so. So um, at Quantinium, we, we are in the Oxford team, as Bob has probably said, a big group uh, focusing on experiments for uh, QNLP. And I will guide you through the theory, how we build models for QNLP. And then at the end, I will show you uh, specifically some of the results we have obtained very briefly. Uh, if you want more details, we can talk later. And then at the very end, I will show you a specific experiment, only one, um, basically a blueprint for an experiment. But that doesn't mean that that will be the only one. That is only the first step for for large-scale QNLP with um, uh, text circuits. So let's get started. So um, I have here Bob, I have John Firth, and Jim Lambeck. And each one has contributed a specific idea. And if you get these three ideas, you get quantum disco models, right? Quantum from Bob distributional from John Firth, who says that you shall know the meaning of a word by the company it keeps. Basically, the guy was saying, create word embeddings from large text by counting how they occur um, in each other's contexts. And Jim Blumbeck was saying, I love algebra, so I will make a quantum, well, I will make a grammar model based on algebra. And we will see how quantum and algebra play very well together. I'm sure Bob talked about this briefly. But here I will show you how we use this to build quantum models specifically. So John Firth's um, idea for word embeddings here specifically will mean I will create my word embeddings. I will stick my meanings inside Hilbert space. right? And my model will manipulate these meanings so that I can make a task in NLP work. Uh, the compositional aspect is what uh, gives us some sort of science-based, uh, science some sort of scientific handle of what's going on in language, because I don't want to be doing the mainstream thing, which is stick a bunch of layers together in huge neural networks, train it in a, okay, initially stupid task, but then it does uh, impressive things, like uh, the things you have seen in the news, GPT, whatever. However, what goes out of the window is interpretability and knowing what's going on what's going on in, inside this giant inscrutable matrices of real numbers. So um, to tie things together, let's start from where Bob left off. But I won't, I won't dwell uh, too much in this because uh, it has been covered. I will just say that um, my tools will be boxes and wires as it has been throughout the whole day. I have states, I have effects, I have processes, I have scalars. And I also have an operation that allows me to kill wires, which is the discard. And it's all boxes and wires and always has been. So this is our, our base for, for thinking about things and building models. If you remember from the previous talks today, you should remember, uh, there's two ways to compose boxes. One is sequential and one is parallel. So one process after the other and one is at the same time, right? And by these two, um, ways of composing diagrams, and Richie will show you during the demo how you can do this in software with DiscoPy. 
with these two ways of composing diagrams, uh, well, boxes, you can make any bigger uh, diagram composed of small boxes, right? So from small processes, you can compose them to make big processes. And there's special kinds of boxes that if we open up inside, we see that there's just wirings, for example, a swap, the identity, a cup and a cup. Most importantly, I want to focus on what happens when you stick cups and cups together to make a snake. And Bob has talked about this already. This is like in quantum in teleportation. But here, abstractly, it just means that wires can wiggle, right? I don't care about their shape. I just care about what they are connected, uh, like how they are connected. And the big selling point of this is that I want to be build models such that the wiring actually means something something, right? So that when I look inside my model, when I open it up, and I can see what is connected to what, I can at least somehow understand something. Because if you, for example, see these um, wirings that people draw uh, in big neural network diagrams, these, these wirings actually don't mean anything. You have to then, you have to train in a big task, and then go back and inspect. I don't want to have to do this. I want to have my model be such that its architecture actually means something. And here, the wiring will mean something. It will basically mean how information is flowing around. In quantum, it's quantum information, but more generally, it's just information. It depends on what type of distributional semantics I'm giving to the models. Today, we'll only talk about quantum semantics, so the wirings will tell us how quantum information, i.e. meaning, is flowing around in my models. Linguistic processes. Um, Let's go from word to sentence. I have some words in a sentence. I compose them together according to grammar, like Jim Lambeck was saying. And then I make a sentence, right? I make the meaning of the whole. This is how pregroup grammar composes things. Every word gets uh, some types assigned to it. And then the types have some algebra that says n with n to the r, which is its right adjoint, composed together. And this composition I will. Um, show with these cups, i.e. wirings. So my grammar will only be wirings. All of my meaning is inside the word states. And grammar is wiring, and it just tells me how to compose things. So if I have the meanings of the words, I compose stuff according to grammar, I get the meaning of the whole sentence. And that meaning is flowing on the S type wire. The first obvious model native NLP task you can do is check how similar two sentences are. And this is how you do this. You take one sentence, sun melts gelato. You, it's a state. It's a sentence state. You take an effect, which is some other sentence, upside down. Upside down stuff are effects. And that other sentence is ego, like, what is it? Monk dissolves ego, right? Maybe melts is similar to dissolves, but the nouns are quite different. So this whole thing will have some overlap. But I cannot evaluate my overlap yet. This is just the shape of it. This is a blueprint for me to build my model yet, uh, later. I haven't showed you that yet. And then if you want to go beyond sentence level, if you want to go to text, because there is this rock star who I follow on Twitter who says that it's the future, and I believe him. So if you compose sentences, you will get text. How do you compose sentences? Well, with DiscoCirc. What does DiscoCirc do? DiscoCirc Disco says, I don't believe it's sentence space. Actually, sentence space is basically a bunch of nouns if you look inside. So this Coserc says nouns are first class citizens. You have some, you can initialize a bunch of meaning vacua. Let's call them like this. And then every, every one of these are distinguishable. So to every one of these wires, a specific noun is uh, corresponding. Then all of these nouns, they go into some text process, as we had before for a sentence, but now it's for a whole text. There is a grammar that we are developing in Oxford, but it's for a text level grammar, not only for sentence. And then the nouns, after they get modified by that text process, they exit, modified. So it's a very dynamic thing. Now, le let us see how this text process is, uh, what, what is it composed of? The, the most basic thing is let's make some noun states, right? I have this meaning vacuum, and then there is a noun preparation box. This prepares noun states. So basically, you have the, the meaning vacuum. You have a noun preparation box. 
And this prepares a noun state for this noun. Sorry for the squeaks. Okay, this is how I make noun states. They are initial states, they enter a text. So, now I have order one processes. These, these are boxes, they are not states, they are processes, right? If you remember before at the sentence level, I had every word be only states. Everything was zero order and then grammar was telling you how to compose. Here I'm making distinctions. I said nouns are first class citizens. That makes them states, zero order. If I go to other type uh, parts of speech like adjectives or verbs, they will be processes that modify the lower order stuff, which is nouns. An adjective modifies a noun, right? So if I have, for example, an adjective, right? It will act. Oh my God! Sorry. Let's see if this helps. Um, I will have some noun entering, and this will give me out a modified noun. For example, a car. Red. Okay. This is the state of red car. The intuition here, it's basically the point is that we're following our intuition to build models. And it's not just our intuition. It's not just uh, loose things. All of this stuff is based on formal linguistics. And there's a lot of um, formal language theory behind it that, that uh, formulates it in a way that it generalizes. Now, let's see how a verb would, would look like. Say you have a verb like uh, loves, standard examples. You have a dog. You have human, dog and human enter loves, dog loves human, right? So this is the combined state for the, for the phrase dog loves human, right? So this, this thing, this loves box, is coupling to them together and then they are not separable anymore. They entered as two independent things. They got inter uh, interacted by some verb. And then now they are in combined state that, state that if it was a quantum state, I would tell you it's entangled. And that's exactly what I'm going to tell you later. But now the pictures tell you exactly the same story without me having to tell you anything about quantum. So you see it's a feature of the model for language in the abstract. OK, this is order one stuff. Order two stuff. Yes, the order matters, of course. It matters if, uh, if dog is here and human is here or the other way around. Of course, we also love our dogs, but sometimes uh, love is not two-way street and you have drama, right? <coughs> okay. Now I'm going to... Yes, that's right. Uh, but the places in which I have inputs and outputs are distinguishable. I mean, I'm not drawing my boxes like this, right? I'm not drawing it like this. They're not like the spiders of ZX, right? Uh, this is different from this. This, this box is different. Um, now, I will go only one, one order higher, which is two order, uh, second order. Let's, let's think of an example here. Uh, an example would be an adverb, right? An adverb is a modifier of a modifier, right? An adverb modifies a verb, and verb modify noun. So, um, for example, I can have quickly, and I can have runs, okay? This is quickly runs. The higher order thing modifies the lower order thing. This is the point of, of going order two. There are also order three things sometimes, but I'm not going to get there today. Ask me later. Um, and now if you have a text, like a story, this is my simplified uh, version of the matrix. Best movie ever. This is the script of the movie, right? You have the nouns that go in, Neo, Morpheus, Trinity, Matrix, Kung Fu, right? 
And this is, this is how it goes. Like uh, the verbs become boxes that modify nouns. You have, uh, you see Neo, uh, well, what do I have? Morpheus finds Neo, I have, uh, then Neo goes into quickly exits matrix, then I have Trinity loves Neo and so on, right? <coughs> so you have the characters with their initial states, there is a story that happens to them and then they exit modified. By the way, our team is developing a tool that does this in an automatic manner for a large fragment of, of English. Um, it's basically all based on CCG parsers. They exist, they are trained on huge CCG uh, tree banks, and then our team has figured out a way to, um, to use coreference resolution to see what nouns are the same between different sentences, and then you string them all together into a big text diagram. So this is not just drawings. I mean, they are my drawings, but you can, you can see how it works also in software. And Richie can show you uh, some of this later, but um, I don't think we can make it available yet, but um, coming soon. So you see, the bigger the story, the bigger the text diagram. So I'm not gonna draw you huge text diagrams, but I really want you to, to, to remember that this is how it's gonna be. My scaling parameter for my problem size here is the text diagram. This is gonna be important later for when I talk about advantage and, and why we wanna go quantum even. So the bigger the story, the bigger the text. So the, the wider means more nouns and the deeper means more stuff in the story happens, right? Nouns, adjectives, uh, verbs, and stuff like that. One model native task, text similarity. You take two texts, you wanna see how similar the stories are. There are texts that belong, uh, there are nouns that belong to the, uh, that are common to the two stories. There are nouns that belong only to the one text and there are nouns that belong only to the other texts. All of these sets of nouns create a noun universe, okay? I put all of the nouns uh, side by side in tensor product. The nouns relevant to text one enter that text. The nouns relevant to text two enter the other text from the bottom. Text two has become upside down because it's an effect, right? And then if you take this overlap, this should have the meaning of text-text similarity in the same way as, as uh, sentence sentence similarity, similarity worked it's just the same generalization it's a generalization of the same idea so compositionality allows us to take small ideas and generalize them to larger contexts without thinking more that's the point um, another model native task that is not global it's not taking all of the nouns in the universe and doing something with them this is a local task i discard all of the other nouns that exit from a text i don't care about them i just care for example to check how much the noun at the position I, what is its similarity with its past self after it exited? So this is like, okay, I gave it a cute name, quantifying the character arc, right? And if you take this idea of throwing out all of the nouns you don't care about and doing something local with one or some of the nouns, you can do something which is actually done in the real world. There, there exists real world data out there for this task. This is called question answering. So what do you do? You take a context text that says a bunch of facts. That, that's text uh, T1. One there shouldn't be there, just T, okay? You discard all of the nouns that are not relevant to the question. You take the question, you make it into affirmative statement, you stick it as an effect, so basically, you do text similarity between the text and the question, but the question acts locally as an effect. So you can throw away all of the other nouns. Now, imagine my text, my context text scales. My question will not also scale, most likely. Usually questions are uh, small. Knowledge uh, and, and context can scale, but usually you ask questions of, of some finite amount. So, or, or like finite support here to be, to be precise. So I have local question, and then you should imagine that the text grows in size if my context text uh, grows. So now let's finally go quantum. All of this was abstract for model building. Okay, um, I started half past, right? Okay. When we go quantum, we want to respect the tensor products. What? Can I have a brief question? Uh, sure, sure. It, it, 
if I want to ask a question about an attribute, how does this work? So if I want to, for example, I have a red car, whatever, second order thing. Can uh, right. I, and if I say, uh, give me the color of the car, that's quite tough you because can it's say, not a noun. Yes, you can say car is red. It's a statement. Stick it as an effect to red and car. So red is an adjective. Um, le well, let me think. Uh, car is red. Yes, car is red will be a, a legit text diagram. You can flip it upside down, dagger it. Now it's an effect. So car will exit the text that says whatever the car is. You stick the car is red as an affirmative, as an effect, and if you have a high overlap, you're confident that it's yes. red. Okay. If the context text said uh, uh, car is blue and then you stick car is red, you should have low overlap. This is the idea. Any other questions before I go to model building? Yes. I need the microphone, otherwise it's not going to be recorded. So when you mentioned the overlap between uh, the entry in state and the effect, uh, is it about, uh, I mean, you have to define it quantitatively, right? Uh, so what is the overlap between red and blue or uh, happy and sad? Because Otherwise, everything is orthonormal if it's not equal. So there should be some metric, I guess. This is the point of going to model building. So I haven't said anything about how you make anything quantitative, right? This has been all abstract, and it has nothing to do. It's only the compositional part. I have been only talking so far about the compositional part. But this framework is called DISCO, distributional compositional. The distributional aspect is exactly what you're saying, is making everything quantitative, right? Now we can give a distributional semantics. We can decide what are the spaces on which the states are defined, what are the state spaces that the processes modify, right? We will decide that, they, that we want them to be quantum Hilbert space and quantum processes, right? States will be defined in quantum uh, Hilbert space, uh, processes will be quantum maps, and so you can get quantitative results by doing uh, by like exactly the same way that you get quantitative results if you do anything in quantum. You take overlaps of states, you measure operators, stuff like that. OK. Um, now, why do I have a big picture of the tensor product here? Is because quantum theory inherently is um, is, is built on the tensor product. Systems compose according to the tensor product. And I want that because my grammar theory, my, my boxes and wires that describe my grammar model, the compositional part, are also behaving as if they compose with tensor products. Because, because basically I have non-separability when I compose things. Um, this is what Bob is calling Schrodinger compositionality or quantum compositionality. I'll just call it compositionality. So now, right, tensor product before with the diagrams means just things happen in parallel. When you, when you give the model semantics, tensor product will be Kronecker product. The usual, um, so if you are simulating these things with linear algebra, because linear algebra is how you simulate quantum theory on your laptop or by hand or on a blackboard. It's the Kronecker product, the usual outer product, the Kronecker product of two matrices or vectors or tensors or whatever. Quantum theory, if you have a quantum computer and you put quantum systems together in a controlled setup, they will just compose by themselves with a the tensor product, right? So yes, the usual tensor product. Here I have I'm really beating the dead horse to, to show you that tensor product is flowing around. Um, so this F is, is what I'm calling my semantic functor. Um, jargon aside, it's basically a map that does OK. Um, there is a mistake here. I'm, I'm sorry about this. They, it, but OK, it's a map that does 
box-wise um, substitution of um, the boxes and the wires, right? So every wire gets uh, assigned some qubits. So for example, we had before at sentence level that every word gets a type. The noun type will get qn qubits. The sentence type will get qs qubits. So every wire um, carries some number of qubits, and it's up to us to decide how many they are. The number of qubits decides how big the Hilbert space dimension is that flows are, uh, along this wire. Um, if I have q qubits on a wire, the Hilbert space is 2 to the q dimensional, right? Everyone knows that. My mistake in this picture is that I have bent the wire on the right to, to make it an effect, but I didn't do the same on the, on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, negligence on my part. Um, but you will understand from context in the next slide what's going on. Now, I want you to focus on sun that goes into melts, right? Sun becomes a state preparation circuit, unitary. So it's a circuit, quantum circuit U, that is parameterized by a control parameter set, theta, and I have subscript S. So theta S is theta for sun. Okay, so sun gets its own parameters that go into a quantum circuit and they prepare a quantum state uh, for the word sun. The same happens for melts. There is a theta melts that goes in a parameterized quantum circuit and prepares a state for melts. Um, And, and now, after you post-select all of these, um, okay, let me, let me show you here. So the cup, the cup becomes a C naught and then post-selections. This you can prove with uh, the, the rules of ZX. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's trivial, you just do this. You have a cup, like, like uh, in Bob's lectures, you say I'm gonna put a, an identity spider here, it doesn't mean anything. Oh, by the way, I can grow a, a, a one-legged spider from either with unfusion. And then, oh, look, this is a C naught gate, right? So a cup is basically a C naught followed by post-selection on the plus state and the zero state, right? So now that you're experts on ZX, this should be obvious to you. So the cups become C naught and post-selection. If you bend stuff around, which you can, but you have to be careful that you're bending with 180 rotation. So that is not dagger, that is transposition. Um, it's easy to make this mistake when you, when you write the code, but um, you have to automate it once and then forget about it. But uh, this, is, this is crucial. This is transposition when you bend states to effects in, di in, uh, in disco cut, right? At the sentence level. Um, and now, if you have two sentence states to um, two sentence quantum states, you can of course take their overlap. This, this comes back to, to the, the question before, how do you quantify this? You can take the overlap of two quantum states, right? You can use whatever protocol you like. You can use the swap test or something. There are standard things to do this. So you have the quantum state of one sentence, the dagger of the quantum state of the other sentence, and this is a valid quantum operation. You can evaluate it on, on any quantum computer you like. I haven't told you how, what these thetas are that embed my meanings. I will tell you about it later. Um, and then when we go to text level, which is, which is the most interesting thing, again, let us see how we replace my, uh, how I make my circuit components for all of, the, um, all of the parts of speech according to their order, right? I said I have zero order, one, uh, order one, order two things. So the order one things are the nouns. So what happens to the nouns? Well, I will choose a convention for my meaning vacuum. It's going to be the zero state, right? All of the wires in disco circ carry noun types, right? We, we said nouns are first class citizens. Nouns flow around and stuff happens to them. So all of the wires will have the same number of qubits, right? Because they're of the same type. So QN, I choose it once. It's the dimension of the, uh, of the Hilbert space flowing around my wires. And you see a, a, a noun preparation uh, circuit will be this u theta n. 
and this theta n depends on the noun n, right? So um, dog will have its own parameter set, house will have its uh, own parameter set will be different, and so on. And this, this thing prepares a, a state, right? So for example, we have theta of car. This state is prepared by u theta car hitting the, the vacuum, which I chose by convention to be the zero state. And it, that's without, without loss of generality, right? So if you go to the one order things, they will be, well, um, the order one things are easy. I'll just make everything be unitary. This is, this is a choice. I can make them be uh, generic quantum maps by adding ancillas and discarding them, but let's not go there. Uh, it's everything I will say from now on um, will still hold if I make these more general quantum maps. So let's stay with everything being unitary. So whenever I see a box, I will make it a unitary box. And, and you see, um, whenever I have adjectives or verbs, I will always respect, you never have this situation where you have more wires that come in a box than exit a box. There is a conservation of nouns, right? As many nouns enter a text, as many nouns uh, exit a text. So it's fine to have everything unitary because unitaries need to have the same input and output um, dimensions, right? So if I have some adjective, for example, I'll give it a unitary and it will be parameterized by some parameter set specific to that adjective. Now the higher order thing is a bit strange. One choice is to say, I'll break it like this, like a sandwich. I have this, this comb thing that is a higher order, um, uh, higher order box, like, like for an adverb. I will, I will break it into unitaries that sandwich something. So let me show you what I mean. So if I have, um, uh, quickly runs was the, our example before. I will have u theta weekly, some parameter set with index one, and there will be some other second parameter set for quickly. So quickly has two parameter sets. And whenever I have something like runs, so u theta run, is just uh, sandwiched by these two guys, right? So these two guys for quickly sandwiching runs will return to me a circuit that is supposed to be for quickly runs, the whole thing. Of course, um, I can simplify my life. I can say from order two and above, um, I don't want things to be quantum uh, processes. I don't want everything to be quantum processes all the way to highest orders. But also, you know, um, you won't have infinite order stuff. This is uh, usually in language, everything stops to order three or four, right? Um, I mean, how often do you have modifier or modifier or modifier or modifier? It's, it's kind of insane. So what I can do is say, um, I don't want this to be quantum maps. Another choice is to have, say, so I have here for, for runs, I have runs. And I can have a classical control for quickly that modifies the parameters of runs, right? So this can be a classical function like a neural network parameterized by its own parameters for quickly. And here, its input is theta runs. So theta runs enters quickly and is modified and enters here. So that thing is total is together quickly runs. I mean, also this makes sense, right? Quickly just modifies, uh, modifies the, the, the runs, right? It's, um, it's, like, it's like a knob um, or like a very. Very will also be higher order, very red. I can have like a classical control on, on the circuit that is very and just modifies the parameters of, of, of red. I just have very red or, or like less red, stuff like that. Um, but all of these are just design choices, and they're all valid. Um, okay, similar idea. 
And now to come back to the, the point of how you do something interesting with um, quantum text circuits. Quantum text circuits for question answering, for example. As I said before, I have a context text. It's a big quantum circuit now, the context text. This, uh, and this theta t is all of the parameters. It's, it's, the, it's the concatenation of all the parameter sets all of, of all of the words that, invo that are involved in that text um, up there in the t text. Theta q, the same. Theta q is the set of all parameter sets of all of the words that appear in the question Q. So I have a big quantum circuit. All of the nouns go in. Yeah. <clears throat> so zero states are initialized on, on Q and qubits for each wire that you see here. Every wire is for a noun. They enter a big text circuit like my, my matrix story before. <clears throat> the, the nouns that are irrelevant the, the, the quantum wires that are irrelevant to the question are discarded. I never measure them, right? That's what discarding means. And then I do the dagger circuit of the question text, which has been turned affirmative. It's an effect. And then basically I can measure everything. I can do a bunch of uh, measurements. I have deliberately drawn these with greens because they are the so-called bastard spiders from the, from the Dodo book the, that, uh, that Alex and Bob wrote, picturing quantum processes. If you want to see how quantum and classical wires interact, uh, first of all, you need to draw two types of wires. The whites are the, the quantum, the greens are the classical, and then there are extra rules of how uh, classical and quantum wires interact. Um, the, the green dot is basically a Z-spider. Um, and and um, very conveniently, it, it uh, models the coherence, i.e. measurement in the Z basis. So basically, this thing tells me, measure all of the qubits there. If you measure all of the qubits there, you will get a probability distribution for all of the bit strings, i.e. in the computational basis states, that... Um, uh, that are defined by all of the green wires, right? If you go and see the probability of all zeros, this is quantifying the, this overlap, right? Because zeros, zero comes in when you prepare a noun. When you unprepare a noun, you want to see how much zero comes out, right? Because this theta q basically includes the unpreparation of the nouns that are included in theta q. So if I see how much zero is coming out, how, much, how often I measure the zero state there, this gives me the overlap of this whole question answering thing. This is very important. Questions about this? Because this is basically the whole setup. You can take this and generalize it to other things. And since I set up the whole thing motivated by wanting my wirings to mean something, I set it up so that it has tensor structure. I could have said, well, forget quantum, or I don't know about quantum. Maybe I wanted everything to just be tensors. If I ended up, because the model says it, that's how you should do question answering, right? It's, this, is, this, how, this is how the task looks like in the model. This is the native way of doing question answering, or text-text similarity, right? Local text-text similarity. If I had tensor semantics, generic tensor semantics, Evaluating this thing grow, uh, becomes exponentially hard if the text, context text scales, right? Because if contracting tensor networks, at least exactly, and also approximately, is hard. You need exponential resources. However, I set everything up so that it is uh, valid as a quantum operation, right? Of course, simulating these quantum operations, you would use tensor networks and, 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 and linear algebra on, com on a computer, basically, which is exponentially hard. Quantum theory, quantum mechanics is hard to simulate. But if you have a quantum computer, this is how you do it, right? Now, if this beats uh, GPT, whatever, it's besides the point here, because we started by a motivation. We started by a motivation to build a model. Then you make it work. It's, it's backwards. 
It's not make a brute force, all powerful God, and throw it at tasks. It's, it's, it's being more of a scientist uh, about things, even if they don't perform uh, amazingly at first. Um, you have a question? Yes. Um, so, this type of circuit uh, for verified uh, statement, no? uh, you dug, you dug, uh, is the, uh, it's, it's, it's the dock product of two state. So if uh, it's like the fidelity. Yeah. So if all zero enter and all zero, I miss sure I measure in output, it means that the statement is true. But uh, there is, uh, as far I know, if the system is too large, uh, this process don't work. Uh, 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 don't work because there is the uh, uh, catastrophic uh, uh, catastrophe orthogonal, uh, orthogonal orthogonality catastrophe. So uh, I think the, what you're saying is that the, the bigger the circuits, the more random they will look. See, the more and, and the more it will scramble, and getting the the zero state it's exponentially unlikely. No, there is. What uh, you're saying? Uh, also for a, a noiseless uh, circuit, uh, if the system... I'm also talking about noiseless. Noiseless, okay. Yes. Uh, if the system is large enough, yeah. uh, the uh, orthogonality cat catastrophe uh, make, uh, uh, turns out to uh, 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 falsify, falsify the statement, uh, but in reality it's true because the, the, all the state uh, uh, appears orthogonal if the system is large enough. No? I don't know if I express correct myself. Uh, maybe I can ask this question uh, yeah, maybe, at the end of maybe the lesson. But, uh, My understanding about the orthogonality catastrophe is that you, when you solve the generalized eigenvalue problem, you end up with lots of linear dependencies, and then your matrix inversion becomes unstable. unstable. Whereas here, you're just solving a, a variational problem. So, yeah, so the, the basis is naturally orthogonal, I think, here, because you're using qubits. Well, before we say anything about variational, I, yeah. I need to go and, and explain two experimental approaches because the word variational is important there. Um, this, I think this, this conversation has, has some depth. Let's have it later. I think it's, it's basically about how likely it is to even to measure zero if the Hilbert space grows, if the Hilbert spaces grow too much for generic circuits U and UT and, and UQ, right? It's true that if these circuits are random, um, like generic, typical, right? Um, and I'm growing the number of green wires, on average, yes, it will be exponentially unlikely in the size of the green wires to, ev to ever measure zeros. I think this is similar to what you're saying. But remember what I said before. I, I don't want to be growing the, the, the number of green wires. My, the, my questions are always local, and the scaling parameter of my problem is the context text. The only text that grows here is the T, not the Q. I mean, if, uh, if what you were saying was, uh, was a problem, then the whole BQP thing would be a problem. The BQP setup, the whole of, of how we define quantum Turing machines and decision problems with, with quantum circuits is, is like this. You just throw all of the qubits in a, in, a, in a circuit that grows, and you just measure one. And here I'm not measuring one, I'm measuring five. 
that, uh, but I'm not measuring some function. I'm not measuring a number of qubits that is a function of the t text. I'm always measuring, say, five, and that's it. So, so the number of sorts you will need is finite for a specific additive error to, to this probability p of all zeros, independently of how the other thing scales. So, I never said before what is the u of theta is, right? u of theta is some unitary that I said is parameterized. In practice, how do you do this? You pick some circuits that people have studied in quantum machine learning that they like because they are expressive, right? Expressive means that, for, um, that they explore the Hilbert space on which they are defined quite effectively as, as if they were random for random um, choices of their parameters, their control parameters. Here, the parameterized gates are the rotation gates and the control rotation gates. Uh, the thetas are not shown, but it should be implied. Hadamard, of course, and CZ are not parameterized, but Rx or control Rx and Ry are parameterized. They have the thetas inside. One choice of U theta is this thing on the left, right? I I've drawn them to go down to be uh, in the spirit of all of these um, language circuits because everything is read from top to bottom. But... Um, Usually people write in their papers stuff, you know, quantum process that go from left to right. So here I've rotated a bit. Sorry about this. But these are actually the circuits that we do use in our experiments. Um, another choice is the thing on the right. It's three layers of, of that block, which is a layer of Hadamard, then a layer of control Z, then a layer of Rx's, and then I repeat this three times. How many layers of this block I choose is my choice. It's a hyperparameter. How thick these things are is my QN. It's, uh, it's a hyperparameter again. I choose how many qubits I want to assign to every wire, right? Um, so I said I'm going to talk about some approaches of how we, we do experiments. One approach is train everything in task. Build my text circuit. Leave all the thetas free. Pick a task. My task defines a cost function. No, I'm doing quantum machine learning. However, I didn't pick some random ones that I found somewhere. My, my text circuit is informed by the problem. The problem here is language. The, the structure that um, the circuit inherits from the problem is syntactic structure, right? The whole structure of the diagram. It's not just some random circuit, black box. Um, you make a cost function for your task, you evaluate performance. One of the things we do one of the things we do is, is uh, binary classification, the easiest task you can think of. You have a bunch of sentences. Each sentence gets its own sentence circuit, right? Some of the, uh, the words, uh, I mean, most of the words will appear in more than one sentence, which allows the thing to even train. And then you, you can do supervised learning. You have a, test set, uh, a train set and you have a test set. You keep the test set aside and you train the thetas such that the quantum circuits predict the label. Every, every, um, every sentence will have a label, right? Uh, zero or one. This is a pre-group diagram like before, right? If you measure the, the qubit there uh, at the sentence wire, you will get some probability that it's zero and some probability that it's one. Zero for one class, one label, one for the other. You train the thetas such that you measure the correct labels, i.e. the labels that the train set says that uh, these sentences have. After you have trained, you evaluate with these parameters for the words after they have been trained in task. You, you execute the circuits in the test set and you see your accuracy, like how well the model generalizes in unseen data because it's they're unseen because the test set you kept it aside. And this is all this variational loop here, right? The train set sentences become um, quantum circuits, as I showed you. They go to some quantum processor. You measure out the class label, their probabilities. If you're not happy with, um, with, uh, with them matching the, the train set labels, you iterate, you update your parameters with some optimizer, 
the thetas, and then you loop around until you're happy, right? And then you just evaluate on the test set again on a quantum computer. You can do this with, uh, with disco cut diagrams at sentence level. Um, I'm gonna do a parenthesis and show you what we're working on now. Because before, with disco cut, we have these, these two experiments published in these two papers, but uh, they're toy experiments, as in the data is artificial, it's 100 or 300 sentences, not, not that big, it's, it's toy, right, for NLP standards. Vocabulary is very small, but it works. It was a proof of concept. Now, if you change it, uh, and you don't use Lambix pregroups, if you use just CCG trees, you don't need to post-select anymore. You can just have tree structures. They're easier to train on quantum computer. There are no barren plateaus. I'm not gonna stay too much on this, but it's a work in prog progress and it's very exciting. Um, so what we do is we can tackle thousands and ten thousands of sentences. They can be movie reviews, they can be cl uh, clickbait news titles, or even DNA sequences. If you don't have uh, syntactic information, you can just use this middle thing, which is um, uh, a binary tree with uh, disentanglers which is inspired by condensed matter theory for critical systems. And then if you combine these two ideas, syntactic information with this uh, entanglement uh, filtering thing from condensed matter from, um, if you have heard of, of them, they're called MERA uh, tensor networks or, or convolutional, quantum convolutional neural networks. We can combine these two and make syntactic convolutional neural networks and so on. And all of these things work very, very nicely. Um, and, and soon we'll run them on actual machines as well. And, and then, and then there will be a paper. So stay tuned. Um, and now when we go to Disco Cirque, this is the, the interesting thing that I want to close on because it's, it's, it's something that we have also seen working um, in task, right? So I, I will tell you exactly what I mean now. So instead of training in task, what you can do is instead of doing quantum machine learning, like I, I said, instead of doing supervised learning, what you can do is say, I wanna do question answering. Okay. But I don't want to train my thetas in task. Okay, I will pre-train my thetas. To pre-train your thetas, you need to do basically what classical NLP does, which is make some word embeddings that are pre-trained, task agnostic, right? The usual methods you might have heard of are called word to vec or GLOVE, things like that. We can exactly use these methods. Specifically, I, I, I can talk about GLOVE. Um, you don't need to know too much now. Um, I can show you what the cost function looks like. We can ask me later. The point is that you can pre-train stuff. You can pre-train the, the component circuits that go in a big text and then you trust the compositionality such that when you stick them together in a big text diagram, which is hard to evaluate classically, the meanings compose um, in a meaningful way. Like, they, they don't generate gibberish. That's why I'm, I say trust in compositionality. You trust in the model. But of course, this is not blind trust. What we are doing is we pre-train on some corpus, like, um, uh, there is a kid's book corpus that we found, and it's very nice because it has uh, a huge vocabulary, but the sentences are small, and the texts are small. You can take paragraphs, and you can pre-train in Cochrane's matrices. And what you can do then is take a question answering task, which your pre-training had nothing to do with, and use this as a test of compositionality. So this is something we are working on now. But the most important thing I want to say now is that when we pre-train, we can do this classically because we train small components and I can simulate evaluating small components of a big thing. But if I compose them together to make a big quantum circuit, then I cannot evaluate it anymore. Then I do need a quantum computer. This is the globe cost function. Uh, basically what you do is, the important parts of this, of this cost function is this dij. For, so for word i and word j, I have a similarity measure, dij, okay? This dij I can evaluate classically. It's, it's the overlap, for example, of two noun uh, states, or the overlap between two adjective processes, or the two overlap between, uh, or the overlap between an, adject, an adverb and another adverb. Or I can even compare things that are dissimilar, an adverb with an adjective, or an adjective with a noun. 
I can take all of these overlaps by just sticking them together compositionally and then replacing their quantum circuits. But these overlaps are small. I mean, I can simulate 20 qubits on, a, on, on my laptop, right? It's fine, I can train these. And I want to train such that their overlaps match the other important quantity in this equation, which is this minus log xij. This xij is a huge matrix, a co-occurrence matrix that you gather from a huge corpus. Like I said, this uh, kid's book data set, or even you can do it from Wikipedia. You can take all of Wikipedia, and you can count. Xij is basically the frequency uh, that word i appears in the context of word j. That's it. You, you want to make, this is basically realizing John Firth's uh, quote inside Hilbert space, right? I'm making my quantum processes have overlap such that their overlap is proportional to their um, minus log likelihood uh, for, for, for them being in the same context in, in, the, in the corpus. Hey, you pick a window, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. These, these are details of how you train. Um, so people usually fiddle about with these hyperparameters um, and they just find something that works. This is this black magic machine learning, right? Um, and here we also use the black magic approach. You just fiddle about and see what works and then you don't care as long as it works because you just care that these overlaps are representative of their co-occurrence. Now that I trained my quantum states and processes to, to actually be quantum word embeddings, now what I can do with them is stick them in a question answering task. There are data sets for question answering out there. We take them, we take the context text that says a bunch of facts. We get a text diagram that builds us a text circuit. I just replace my pre-trained word embeddings. Now I have a big text circuit I cannot evaluate it. I need a quantum computer for it. The same I do for my question. And then I just measure on a quantum computer as a test about whether compositionality actually works. Right? So this is what I, what I mean. It's not trained in task. Um, if, however, the whole thing is small, because there exist very simplified toy uh, question answering tasks, you can also train in task everything. Don't do any pre-training. Create your circuits like this. For every different question, you get a different uh, circuit to run. You can train, train all of these in task such that the correct answer comes out, right? You can do this. We have done this. It works. It works even with one qubit per wire. It, it was like a WTF moment. It was pretty cool. Um, So what, what, what you get here is um, you, 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 you need exponential resources to do this uh, classically if the thing is big. Um, on a quantum computer, you can do it in polynomial time. Um, I will be bold enough to say that this is an exponential advantage against simulating the model classically, right? Um, and then on top of that, let me go back. Let me go back and... I remind you that this thing, when you take sentence-sentence overlap, there is a very nice paper by Will Zhang and Bob, which started this whole QNLP business. And there they said, if I have two vectors to compare and I want to see which, which effect has the highest overlap with my vector, I can invoke closest vector, uh, the closest vector algorithm, quantum algorithm, which basically is Grover under the hood. It, you Grover search over the possible effects, and you get a quadratic speed up. Okay, it was cool in 2016. Today, not many people care about quadratic speed ups because they believe that the error correction overhead and all of this stuff will be quadratic, so they, they will kind of kill each other off. However, in my very bold statement that I have a exponential speed up, when I do question answering at text level with quantum discoserg, I can also have my extra bonus quadratic speed up on top because I can also grover over the answers. And this is something that we are putting down in, in, in a theory paper now and stay tuned. And yeah, now I think uh, Richie will, will give you a very nice demo of Lambeck, which is 
about sentence level QNLP that automates all of the experiments I talked about. And you can reproduce all of our papers. And he will show you also how you compose diagrams to make text circuits. And uh, yes, have you joined the Zoom? I need the music. I sent it to you.